close to you, but you should know a little bit more about him. Um, his father is speaking about the fa his father's discovery of the Mohs surgical technique. His father, Dr. Fred Mohs Sr., was the inventor of Mohs surgical technique, which remains the best treatment for many skin cancer cases of state of the art 80 years after its invention. And Fred will talk about the difficulties his father encountered in screening for cancer in the 1930s without the aid of modern technology. He says that this presentation will be short on science and long on the story of the man and the odyssey that resulted in this cure. Um, Fred himself was born in 1937 in Madison and attended Shorewood School, a West High School, UW-Madison, UW-Madison Law School, practiced law first at Axley Reynoldson Firm, and since 1967 at the firm of Mose McDonald, Winter Paradise, and Ben Nose. Fred is also, as you know, an active real estate developer and owner with his longtime business partner, Nate Brand, and most recently with Nate's son, Nathan Brand Jr. He has been a longtime resident of downtown Madison and has been involved in activities supporting this very special place. He was a 35-year member of the Madison Gas and Electric Board of Directors, he was a UW Regent, a member of the Board of Directors of UW Hospitals and Clinics and the UW Research Park. Also served as a board member of Playcon Corporation and Hopkins Agricultural Chemical Company. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the um, official introduction of Fred Mose that I was given to read to you. Um, but you might use your imagination and see Fred as a sophisticated, impeccably dressed gentleman. Yes, we know that. Now imagine him in jeans, a leather jacket, and a flat top haircut. Uh, a kind of a genteel fork to Marlon Brando, Lee Marvin, and Mary Murphy in The Wild One, maybe something like that. Imagine further that he bolted Madison between his junior and senior years in high school that took a ship to, for, to Quebec from Quebec to Holland and rode 8,000 miles through Europe on his Indian motorcycle with two suitcases and a, back, and, and a uh, sleeping bag attached to it. And imagine that being blessed by the Pope in Rome, he did not fully uh, offset uh, failing to kneel for blessing. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, caused his mother great worry throughout his travels, singed his shoes on Mount Vesuvius, and uh, apparently uh, had an all-points bulletin for that when I'm in London for trying to find his way to the roof of the Parliament building in London. He could explain that later, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and then arriving back in Madison days late for school. Actually, you don't have to imagine it at all. Just look at the headline, City Boy Tours Europe on Motorcycle. That's the other half of Fred Mose. <laughs> <laughs> it's there in the paper for all to see. But Fred, we're thrilled that you're here. Uh, welcome to the podium. Uh, Now I'm going to experiment with my bifocals, which I think I'm going to discard. This uh, podium, see what does it say here? <laughs> Donna Shalala, Memorial Podium. Anyway, <laughs> 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 um, thank you for uh, inviting me. Um, I'll get right into it. Um, I, I met Lester Pines and Roberta Gassman on the sidewalk out in front of our house a few weeks ago, or a month ago maybe, and uh, she brought up the subject of Mohs surgery, and after it was over, she called back and invited me to speak here. Dad was, uh, my father, Frederick E. Mohs, was born in 1910, and died in 2002 after suffering with dementia for almost 15 years. The subject of this talk is how he invented what was originally known as chemosurgery. Only after he was no longer in control did others change the name in his honor. Some of you were here 20 years ago when I helped present him with our Senior Service Award. At that time, I gave a short presentation on his life and work. Dad came to Rotary late in life, after the early stages of Alzheimer's had forced him to turn over his duties to others. This allowed him to take time for lunch, which he usually skipped. Mr. Pete was just up here telling me how he criticized another doctor for taking time to go down to the cafeteria and have a cup of coffee. And that was his work ethic. Um, he came down to the Park Hotel to attend Rotary, and his, uh, I mentioned his sponsor, sponsor Mr. D, um, uh, was famous himself for pioneering uh, brain surgery. The Goodman brothers, whose mothers had been an early patient, came here and kept an eye out for him. When he showed up at the entrance, Dad was uh, Bob Goodman would spring up. They sat right there and uh, guided to the chair between them, but they always say, 
Dad really couldn't carry on much of a conversation by that time, but he loved Rotary, mostly the singing. <laughs> uh, the Origin and Progress of Bohm's Micrographic Surgery. That was the title of an introduction to a book that Dan wrote, wrote on his technique, published in 1956. Initially, I included the entire introduction um, in this talk, knowing that there are a lot of scientists here that are not more me than just the uh, social part that I'm about to tell you. But that wouldn't have left time for anything else. I want to, uh, I do want to say one long sentence that, that was in that uh, introduction. During experiments with various other irritants, zinc chloride was injected in a 20% solution a concentration that inadvertently caused tissue necrosis, in other words, the solution killed tissue. In, in, in incidental observation was that the microscopic structure of the killed tissue was retained. This observation of in situ fixation, in other words, tissue is still in the body, alive, might have been unrecorded and forgotten had it not suggested to him that the idea might be the basis for methods by which Cancers could be excised under complete microscopic control. This is a couple years later, I hope. <laughs> this idea came to him when he was 19 years old and became the basis for his life's work. Eventually, applying a solution to the surface that involved a specially designed paste and very <coughs> the vehicle containing the zinc chloride solution, uh, will be discussed later in how we call that. First, his people. I think you should know a little about his background. He was born in 1910 in Burlington, Wisconsin. His grandfather had immigrated from Prussia in 1848. His mother was the daughter of a prosperous farmer and politician from Baroque. Ed was 10 years younger than his older brother Carl. He was only six months old when his father died of tuberculosis. The whole family followed Carl a little later to Madison, where Carl entered the University of Wisconsin. Grandma couldn't figure out. How to send her son to college without moving the whole family. With the proceeds from the sale of Burlington House, his mother bought half interest in a rooming house on Lake Street, adjacent to University of Philly Skull, a Norwegian maiden lady, who would be her partner for the next 40 years. This is uh, the location is on the west side of the Fluno Center on the Lake Street side. Our mother was the sister of Henry Reynolds, a former member of the pier under the classification of Drake, horses and wagons. Uh, that's Reynolds' transfer story. <laughs> Mom started in 1888 my great grandmother. Uh, Mom started to date Dad in high school. She recalled Dad as being smart but wild. He had a Model T Ford. The newspaper ran an article about the activity of teenagers at the high school, and then a car full of them had driven all the way to Middleton back over the noon hour. When they did a report, was that the driver had accomplished this feat using only his knees to steer. <laughs> <laughs> that would be dead. <laughs> but he was basically a very good boy. Steady hard, all set jobs as a paper boy, tender of boilers and furnaces in the neighborhood, and a delivery boy for a film processor. His old, older brother Carl acted as a surrogate father. When he entered the university, he obtained a job at Bird <laughs> Hall at a biology department, where every night he took care of animals in the biology department. At the same time that Dad was cleaning cages and feeding animals, Dr. Michael F. Geiger, the hard-working chairman of the biology department, was present every night doing fundamental research, the point of which was to discover what was cancer. Parenthetically, Ferris House still exists, just East Lawn House, the Chancellor's residence. That was another long, long, I know, just if you're keeping calm. Um, Geiger showed Dad how to look through the microscope and identify tissue that was cancerous. And how to kill rats that had cancer, make slides for examination. He actually took the person who was supposed to be feeding, uh, feeding the animals, cleaning their cages, and got to working, helping him, uh, taking the treasury out of what he was doing. Um, although Dad had taken biology in high school, he had no particular interest in the field until then. He was still planning to be a radio engineer. Radio was new at the time. He was fascinated with it. Guy and inspired him during those early years at Birchall. And discuss the challenges involved in treating skin cancer. Geiger warned that if one cut into cancer, the cells would escape and metastasize into adjacent tissue. In order to keep that from happening, they discussed, discussed different possibilities for treatment, 
such as using chemicals, so that there would be no cells that could escape the metastasizer. Gary went on to explain that the skin cancer was also was often was not just a lump, which is what it might look like. He explained that the tumor was speculated. It was more like the shape of an octopus and tentacles that might reach out anywhere. If one of those extensions was left to continue to produce cancer, it would then affect adjacent cells along the cancer to grow in unexpected directions. An obvious solution was to kill the obvious cancer and then examine the edges of the dead tissue to see if there was still cancer there and repeat the process until there was no cancer left. The problem with that solution was that by killing cancer, the cellular structure would be destroyed. If you put acid on it, make mush out of it, you could tell what was in it. The only way to pursue this course of action was to develop a method of killing cancer that would preserve its cellular structure for examination. This was easier said than done. But of course, Dad was still planning to be a doctor. He was planning to be a radio engineer. Nevertheless, Geiger, Dad's brother Carl, pressed him to abandon his radio interest and pursue the development of a process for chemical that would kill tissue without destroying its cellular structure. Dad's, Dad's hero had experimented with hundreds of materials in his attempt to create an electric light bulb. And Geiger had told him that uh, Uncle Carl very cleverly used this in urging him to do the same for cancer care. They hooked it. Perhaps I should stop here and explain the problem. Wisconsin had a huge population of Northern Europeans who were farmers, who worked at other occupations, outdoors and building railroads. They were exposed to plenty of sun, especially in their heads, necks, hands. Their tumors were obvious, raising in the early stages the size of a penny. Two huge, horrible manifestations that looked like cauliflowers. Noses, lips, and necks. Occasionally, you would see people on the street that had those tumors. I remember one Saturday afternoon in the late 40s when we were leaving Sir Roebuck on State Street. A farmer came up the street with his wife and two children, pressed overalls, and a little blood. House dress. He had an obvious tumor on his ear. We, prepped, uh, we passed him, and Dad turned around and said, Farmer, I need to talk to you. The farmer turned around, so they're puzzled. Well, Dad explained to him that he had a tumor on his ear, that he need, needed to be treated. I could tell that the farmer and his wife already were worried about this as they stood there, fearfully listening to what Dad had to say. He explained that he had a, te a technique for dealing with this problem like theirs, and it was very important that he taken care of, otherwise the tumor would continue to grow up and ultimately kind of death. He reassured the farmer, I remember this very clearly, that the financial aspects would be taken care of, and executed a promise from him that he'd come to the Wisconsin General Hospital on uh, University Avenue and the next week so he could take care of the problem. Dad later told me that he had success over cancer. All of this is amplified in my consciousness because his dad was writing his books or articles on the subject, he would lay out sequential photographs of treatment, starting from, being, from beginning to end on the back of the table of the faith. Thompson, my friends, were busy and were horrified. Noses, lips, entire jaws gone. As time mean, could get worse. I went on, or as the time went on, there were fewer of these extreme cases, and Dad started to think more about end results. At this time, quite a bit later, he started to work with young John Hamacher, a plastic surgeon of my age. Um, helped him think about reconstructive surgery early in the process. The incorporation of that focus has dramatically improved with the outcome of present cases, use of plants, etc. Uh, and also, I should point out, when he was doing this, there was no such thing as antibiotics. I mean, there was only cure chrome and uh, uh, things like that. I mean, uh, gentian violet was used. I mean, there was never cured, but so that doing this kind of surgery and keeping people open for days, that days on end, uh, was unheard of. He had figured out how to do it. But these were dramatic. I mean, the people would hang around outside of the hospital and watch him and say, what is he doing in there? He's kind of still got that person open. I mean, he's not so far, he's taken off the job, and all this blah. Anyway, you know, how could he do it? The person's still alive. You know, he would save their life, but the results were pretty homely. At any rate, now getting back to Dad when he's working with Gaia. Although he was still planning to be a radio engineer, he began to envision a sequence of treatments 
that would begin with the chemical application to kill the cancer, followed by a process of examining the excised tissue layer by layer, following or tracking the cancer until it was eliminated. All of this was happening when he was only 19 years old. He had earned his bachelor's degree in three years, which allowed him not only to go to school, but to continue his project under the lab on the supervision of Dyer. He had two heroes, Henry Ford, for the assembly line, and Thomas Edison for the relentless searching for solutions. Following Edison, Dan started working on the problem of how to kill cancer while still retaining his cellular structure for examination. Finally, incorporating the zinc chloride that I referred to earlier, and especially designed paste. Vehicle. Make a mush, put it on, and that would allow the sink lorry to sink in the way it would be most effective. Over, uh, produce the, the, an accurate control over a wide variety of depths. But before that, he experimented with many chemicals or compounds, never finding one that killed tissue while still retaining its other structure, just as Edison had tested on his materials. The paste idea came from a surprising source. One of grandmother's brothers from Garoba was Uncle Will Tilton. Uncle Will was a, owned a gravel pit, what my mother described as a blow hard and four washer. Uncle Will had brought a cure for, his, for skin disease from an Indian, brought it down to Madison, so the dad, who was in the university and knew something about chemistry, could analyze it and tell him what was in it and why it worked. <coughs> <clears throat> it, uh, the procedure for using Uncle Will's paste made from the ground of animal a naturally occurring substance suspended in sumac high science was desired it was to apply it to the diseased area repeatedly over a period of days until the tumor appeared to be, to be cured in some cases it actually was it was killing tissue but Uncle Will was just guessing Uncle Will wanted to add the patent of paste so they could make a fortune. <laughs> Later, with the encouragement of Tom Whittingham, uh, founder of War, uh, Dad permitted the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation to patent the process and gave it to the world. Um, Uncle Will eventually went into business for himself and was convicted of practicing medicine without a license. <laughs> <laughs> Penitentiary, Tim LaFont. has been written about the most safety. So the part of Uncle Willie is probably over here with me. <laughs> Eventually, the procedure no, uh, no longer needed the paste. It was paced out. Even though he was not ready to operate on humans, he knew that eventually he would have dead human subjects in order to continue his work. Accordingly, immediately after his marriage to our mother, he began a surgical residency in Portland, Oregon. Dad and Ma, Ma returned to Madison where he began to work at the Carvel Institute, who was brand new at the time. It was the first tenant. Just right in the case of the hospital, a great gift to allow the building at that facility. His project was the first to be financed by the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, which had recently become the he got many revenue from patents on vitamin D. Tom Brittingham, president of Wharf, one of the Wharf founders, brought his check each month and followed up on his experiments. Brittingham was brilliant and uh, was very interesting. Let me take a little sidetrack and tell you about the. Boy, I'm not going to miss these two. Anyway, <laughs> let's see. Um, in 1941, Dad had his first brush with fame. As the first research project financed by the newly created Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, his progress was already a topic of conversation among a small number of money alumni. A reporter from the Wisconsin State Journal heard about the young doctor, doctor's promising technique and paid a call on him to ask him how it worked. Ed willingly went into details of his research and his first human trials. The reporter returned with a photographer who took a famous picture of Dad looking through the microscope. The Wisconsin State Journal's headline blared, Cancer Cure Discovered, with a large picture of Dad looking through the microscope. Dad was totally unaccustomed to any type of publicity that was thrust into the limelight. There were some people in the community who did not appreciate it. Local surgeons who had been treating cancer using the conventional method of removing large margins that often left grotesque results, but worse, didn't get it all, reacted negatively. Some called it black magic. 
because of the black paste that was used in those early days, or referred to it as picking the cancer. The Dane County Medical Society initiated proceedings aimed at revoking that medical license and were only deterred when Dr. Middleton, the VA hospital, was named after him. The dean of the University of Wisconsin Medical School threatened to resign if the local surgeons persisted. They backed down, but since soon after they had attended a lunch at the Lorraine Hotel, where surgeons told him he better take care of the future, the future with talking to the press because his treatment was still experimental. They didn't want to hear procedures question. Then the event occurred that changed everything. Abe Quisling, the son of the founder of the Quisling Clinic in Madison, had developed a cancer of the neck that was the size of a small lemon. I know this because a model of that tumor made of lead and painted various colors, uh, signifying these layers that were sequentially removed, was prepared by Dad as a training aid, sat on his desk for his whole career. He's now out of the West Side Post Clinic showcase. The Quislings were famous doctors in the community that had a large Norwegian immigrant population. The Quisling family took Abe everywhere to see what could be done with his tumor, Clark, including the Mayo Clinic. The universal consensus was they should use morphine to keep Abe comfortable, but there was no hope of curing cancer in their type. The senior Dr. Quisling heard about his experiments and early successes with, with patients from the prison in the He asked Dave to try his technique on Abe. He successfully treated, um, the dad successfully treated his tumor and gained the prominent Quisling family as advocates for his procedure. Nevertheless, scholars and critics were still in the majority. All of this was happening when our house on University Bay Drive was being built. On a Sunday, dad was garnishing woodwork himself in order to save money. A huge packer rolled up in front of the front of the finished house. A resplendent Dr. Quisley walked in and announced, Fred, put down that brush. I am finishing this house for you. My mom used to love to tell that story. She said, she could identify something good that my dad did. At any rate, parenthetically, sometime in the 70s, the 2020 program, it was still called chemo surgery, was developed for a 30 minute segment on national TV. The lead model of Abe Quisling's tumor was used in the program. This is black and white in the old days. At the end, the program's narrator stepped forth to attest to the significance of the now well-accepted procedure and held up the tumor model. It was Abe Quisling himself who announced that the patient was me. First memories. My first memory of Dad was when I was standing in my crib on the second floor our second floor apartment on Orchard Street, watching get into the 35 floor coop. It almost seemed like he was doing something important, like driving a car, or talking to men about the construction of our house on the first big drive. I remember in particular watching uh, the basement of our house being dug, being excavated with a horse drawn scoop, and then talking to the man on the horse, very important. From that point on, with the exception of Christmas, Thanksgiving, Fourth of July, and Sunday dinners, most of my daily memories were of Dad were mowing the lawn, trimming the bushes, chilling the snow, washing the car, and mostly being at the hospital. His schedule was regular as coming. He got the driveway at 8, returned to quarter of 6. He'd sit down at dinner in the kitchen at 6. 6 15, he'd get out and quickly put the paper, lie down on the living room sofa for a snooze. About 6 45, he'd get up and go back to the hospital, coming back at midnight, long in the morning. And it's the custom in those days, people would stop in for weekend visits. He'd sit with guests for 10 or 15 minutes, drift off to study, go to the hospital. Small talk and interest. I should mention that in 1947, we adopted our little sister Jane. By the 50s, Dad had a, pro a process that would have made him before he was. He had set up the old Wisconsin General Hospital that had three operating suites or rooms. Most of his operations took place in the dentist chair because they were on faces and necks. Although we could be all over the body, obviously. Uh, once we would have a patient preparing for the procedure, the next week we had Dad performing the procedure with his trusted nurse, Rachel Caruso, at his, at his side, and Bob Patton, his talented technician, preparing slides for Dad in order uh, to examine under, under the microscope that was right there, turn around his chair. The microscope, go back, cut, like that. Um, in many places, and everywhere else, frankly, 
preparation of slides like this might say a day or two, but he had to count to 20 minutes. Um, everything had to go like this was a Ford assembly line. Click, click, click. This seems sort of easy when I describe it, given the fact that some of these tumors were large, complicated, involving work adjacent to large blood vessels. It was not easy. It didn't matter. Tough situations where be conquered. Don't worry about it. Let's keep going. To be frank, this assembly line process has to come on because of its limitations, including the fact that it's almost impossible to stop the process like this going full tilt. Amazingly, for years, it was common for his whole team to just skip lunch and keep rolling. All we want, I mean, people bring their lunch. <coughs> uh, these people were so committed to him, it was just how he found people to do that. Uh, there was a positive atmosphere in the operating room that encouraged patients to endure, endure pain in a way that would seem amazing today. He used anesthetic sparingly because it would slow things down. He would say something. Like, this is going to hurt a little bit, but 10 minutes will be over. Interesting enough, about three and a half hours ago, I was at my cousin Caramo's funeral, and there was a testimonial of, from a patient who spoke about how Carl, the dentist, um, really tried people not to use uh, Novocaine because it slowed down the process, including extractions. And I know that he's my dentist. I mean, I wouldn't, no one in our family would ever think of using having Novocaine for anything. Because the Novocaine is bad. It just takes time. I mean, it slows down the process. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, I <laughs> heard this guy was talking enthusiastically about that situation. <laughs> for a serious person who really didn't talk much, he was reassuring to his patients. He was actually somewhat playful. He loved it when everything was clean. He would take take his used swabs, sort of Q-tips, and throw them across the room in the waste basket and keep dragging the scarring You know, it's very comforting the person suffering from so anesthetic. <laughs> <laughs> that is why it was also amazing for us to see Dad sitting calmly at Rotary, having lunch casually. I mean, it was just not him. Um, unless we forgot him before. Dad wanted the assembly line or to keep production up and cost down. He was horrified when he went to California. In a recent train, he picked him up in his Rolls Royce. Dad found out with his charge and returned home, found to be so productive that no one could get away with charging exorbitant prices. It may seem it may obvious that he couldn't single and really do this, but he actually tried to be doing it anyway. His other method was to see more and more mode surgeons were trained, single surgeons, in order to keep competition up. That was a much better solution. Not being that social, Dad wasn't much of an organizer. But fortunately, one of his trainees, Perry Robbins, practiced in Manhattan. He was great at it. Together, they organized the College of Single Surgeons, which later became the College of Single Surgery. The organization had a major emphasis on creating training programs in major medical schools, both in the U.S. and foreign countries. Beginning in 1940, Dad and Geiger went to St. Louis to deliver a paper. After that, it was Los Angeles, then White Silver Springs, Virginia. In 1945, just after the day, Dad took him out of town. He was to Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, New York City, Pittsburgh, finally Detroit, where Tom and I met Henry Ford and took his hand. Dad had deeper interest in it. Little by little, people came to the Wisconsin General Hospital and University of Edwards train with him. Four years ago, I gave a keynote address to a thousand of those surgeons at their convention in Las Vegas. Astonishingly, only four people who had known him came up to the podium after the talk. All the rest had been trained in the open treatment centers, such as the Cleveland Clinic and medical schools and bureaucracies and other competition. What kind of a father was he? Retrospect the best. Although he was working almost all the time, he made it clear what his standards were hard work, honesty, and courage. He would be fun, it didn't take too long from work. He occasionally even ventured into other areas that he kind of had us join the geology club. His sister Ruth had died during the uh, Spanish flu epidemic in 1919. He'd stayed up all night to pray for her. When the morning found she was dead, he became angry with God. That was his religion. Until he gave another gold Unitarian church at the time, 
is located for Manchester Place parking lot is. Um, there was talk in the church because dad's almost everyone in the entire church was a professor. Um, and dad was really doing nothing but working on the totally fascinating. Uh, professor Professor Rice is um, because his brother was a contractor, a developer, they chose Dad to be chairman. Um, no one in Madison would work with Frank Lloyd Wright except the professors who didn't take seriously Wright's well known shortcoming in terms of business reliability. Um, to put it anyway, Tom, Tom and I went along with Dad and other committee members to tally us weekend after weekend to work with Frank Lloyd Wright, who was quickly, and I, I might say beautifully, produced. Sheet after sheet of options and it produced the kind of spaces the church needed. In the end, the price of the building came in at eight times the original budget. The most bankrupt of parishioners. This was a total crisis. Save money, the parishioners haul a bunch of the stone themselves and stack it up with mason seals. You were looking at one of the few stone carriers left. Shortly, huge for my size. Shortly after uh, the church opened, Dad heard some of the professors justifying Stalin's starvings of the kulaks in a sympathetic way. That was in for our church experience. Try a peacemaker. By the mid 50s, Dad was speaking regularly to the audience in the U.S. In 1957, Tom and I moved to London, Paris, Bonn, and Stockholm, where his presentations were treated with great appreciation and respect. First time I ever. For heel clicking, for instance. Um, then in 1959, with the enthusiastic support of the State Department, first opening up the relations between Russia, he planned a trip to Russia in what appeared to be a rather naive approach to world politics. They would say, I just can't see why we all can't get along. <laughs> Having already made his 1957 tour to European capitals, he now find a much more expensive, extensive program. He said it's been six weeks to talk in Moscow. To do this properly, you would need to learn to speak Russian. From his point of view, he could have had an interpreter, but he was a very busy, overcommitted person. But he wanted to show the Russian servants that he respected them and, and, and that he uh, wanted to demonstrate that to them. It was Sort of funny was he talk Russian himself in the study, but anyway, he did it. They had returned from Russia by way of Paris, where he met Mary, where we were on our honeymoon. He met Dan at the dead of the Hotel Mont Blanc, a movie chef on the left bank. Paul was Mary in the room. Dan was exhilarated. That night we went to the Ritz for dinner, on the late show Toledo, the Mirror Montmartre movie, close to the night club at four in the morning. And there from Los Halls, the front and soup, we returned the night. Broad daylight. Next night was Maxine's. We were there for four, day, four glorious days of dead. <clears throat> dead and me taking turns dancing with Mary and celebrating his Russian triumph. I never saw him so happy or content. <clears throat> During his life, he wrote many articles and detailed books. Well, really, <clears throat> basically, in the <clears throat> day, Dan was perfectly built for the task of his life's work. See the truth of science applied to the greatest good. <laughs> that sounds pretty high minded, but that was him. In conclusion, I'd like to dedicate this talk to Dr. Mitch Javid, the man who liked, trusted, and admired most. Dad would like to tell you that. Thank you. but we appreciate it. Fred, thank you very much. Uh, remember, Alliant Energy Center next week. We'll see you there.